I'm Karen Hurst. I have an eight-year-old son, Nico, with Angelman syndrome, and two uh, five-year-old twins who do not have Angelman syndrome. Uh, and we're really excited about today. So today in this room, here's what's happening. We got PT, we've got OT, we've got sensory, we've got literacy, we've got inclusion. It's going to be great. So that's our plan for today. You can switch between the rooms. There's a five minute break between each of the sessions if you need to change out where you want to be um, for the, the other sessions happening next door. But we know that you want to be in here. So we're going to start in here and we're going to get right into it because we don't have a huge amount of time and I know you all want to get into the information and thinking about how this impacts your kid, what you can do to support uh, your loved one with Angelman syndrome. So here we go. Our first speaker this morning is Amy Epen. Amy is a, uh, a physical therapist who has a practice in New York, and she's been practicing for 15 years. She was here last year um, to talk about all the variety of PT options, uh, no matter where you are, even if you're not in New York, how you can get some of this really amazing physical therapy. And she's back this year to dig in even more with us about what some of those different options look like. So if you've heard of the TheraSuit uh, therapy, um, Amy does that at her clinic. So if you want to have think about questions around that, that'd be cool, or other kinds of intensive physical therapy um, to help support our kids developing their gross motor skills. Um, that's what we're about to hear more about. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Amy Epen. guys hear me thank you all who came out um, today this morning hopefully uh, you get something out of this presentation I just want to take an opportunity to thank everybody that um, sent videos for some video analysis I wasn't able to use all of them but um, they were all good in formulating some correlations between the kids at different stages so um, I greatly appreciate that So basically this presentation is just to go through um, the types of things that can come up and then if, if you understand some compensations that may be existent to combat them earlier. Okay. Let me see the clicker here. Okay, so first we're gonna just go through a new walker um, uh, type of positioning and movement. Some parents ex may observe a young child with certain gait patterns and they want to know what's normal. So first we're going to go through this model and relate um, typical gait to gait with Angelman syndrome. So first with initial contact, um, a child will strike with their toe or their, f or their foot flat first, but the heel to toe pattern is a mature pattern so you won't see that in new walkers. Um, the base of support starts off as a wide base and it, it will narrow um, to trunk level your legs once you start walking a little more. Um, and the position of the upper extremities are always start in a high guard. They come down to a low guard before they become mature. So this is just an example. These are all normal, typical emerging gait. So it could either strike initially with your toes then f uh, or start initially with your foot flat and then heel strike. Most people that started with the initial contact with the toes, 60% of them ended up um, changing to the foot flat and then became a heel strike versus the people that started with the foot flat then went on to heel strike. So normally it takes about 11 months to go uh, in a typical walker that uh, has started before the age of 22 months. Uh, of walking, they, their base of support starts wide, but it takes about 11 months, so almost a full year for their base of support to narrow. Um, so with independent ambulation, the children's uh, arms are positioned with their shoulders in abduction, that means up like this, external rotation and um, elbows in a high guard. Uh, it takes about two months typically to bring your hands lower, but your hands are still flexed in, in kind of a low guard. And then it will take 11 months about to um, start reciprocal arm swings. So that's after they start walking another year about to get full arm swing. 
So now um, here, it doesn't really matter basically what age that you start walking. And I've noticed the kids with Angelmans who start walking, whether they're walking at two, 13, whenever, they kind of start with the same typical gait pattern. So um, here is, let's do Quincy on the left. She, this is her walking with one hand. So she has initial contact with her toes a wide base of support. The right arm is kind of like a high guard. So this is all typical of a new walker. And here's another little guy with a uh, um, wide base of support, high guard, but he's striking with his whole foot flat first. They're both um, typical of new walking. Um, here's just another example. So this is Quincy again, uh, she was walking four months after that video that you just saw. So she's starting with her hands up. Her hand is in her mouth and I, I'll explain that also. There's probably some reasoning why um, that she's putting her hand in her mouth to stabilize. Um, but she does have a short, small gait pattern, wide base of support, high guard. Again, typical with new walking. Here's a girl who started walking at 13 years old, and she also is starting with a high guard, wide base, foot flat. She, her, her hands are um, yeah, a little bit uh, closer together because she's holding something. Um, so that is an intervention we might talk about after. So let's talk about common findings with Angelin syndrome. So. Um, some studies showed that uh, these are the commonalities between the studies, that most kids with Angelman's have a ataxic or broad gait, 88% of them. 95% um, of them have a mouthing behavior, so that might not be a bad thing when a kid starts to walk if, they have, if they're mouthing a ring or have their hand in their mouth. It actually does engage your cervical stabilizers, so it might help them close one degree of freedom so they can walk, so it's okay. You don't have to take their hand out of their mouth or, or maybe give them something else if you don't want their hand um, because it may help them to stabilize their walk. Um, the short attention span is the reason, I, uh, you know, there is 92% of that, so that just means that if you're gonna try walking, you have to do it in a thousand different ways or because they may not have the attention to do it one way. Um, the visual problems I thought was interesting too. There's a high percentage of kids with visual problems and um, we have seven kids I think at our clinic that have Angelman syndrome and, and most of them do like almost like a foot braille. They try to feel out the surface with their foot instead of actually looking at um, the surface to step over. So that's something to keep in mind that you may have to give them some visual attention to look where they're stepping. Uh, another study showed that there was some connection between tone. Um, the kids that have deletions, about 50% had normal tone, but a third of them had high tone and a third of them had low tone. The kids with the imprinting, most of them had normal tone, but there was a small percentage with high tone. And the kids with the mutation, most had normal tone, but there was about a quarter that had low tone. But the star here is that uh, almost 50% of all groups noticed that their baby was a floppy baby when they were younger. Um, the thing about the research that they have out there, they have some research about ambulation and gait, but there's not much research about how they were when they were a baby. Um, so I thought that was interesting. And now um, gathering everybody's videos, looking back on how they may have presented when they were a baby, there may have been things that you could just look out for. And if you notice, try to address. Um, so let me just talk about tone really quick. So tone is basically what your muscles readiness for action. So it, it refers to the sensitivity of the stretch receptors in the muscles. So most of the time, low tone is linked to hypermobility. So if your child has low tone, it's important just to know because the muscles and the connective tissue support the joint and if the connective tissue is very pliable and loose um, and the muscles are weak, there's really nothing holding the joints really solid. Like you need the muscles to be strong around the joints so it kind of holds the capsules and the joints together. Um, so you just may have more risk for joint issue in the future. Um, hypertonia is if they get very rigid. Um, they're very sensitive to any stretch in the muscles. 
So here's an example in newborns, and from some of the pictures and videos that I've seen, it seems like the floppy baby may have been um, a little bit of low tone or hypermobile. Um, so in it, typically a baby, a full term infant would have some kind of, it almost looks like high tone, it's a little bit more tight and stiff, um, you know, but their hands and feet are in flexion um, base versus the low tone baby. It's, it's kind of um, hard for them to lift up their hands and their feet because they're weaker and it requires more effort to lift up, reach for toys and kick their legs. Um, so this is how low tone, whoops, I don't know what I did here. Let me just pause for a second. So this is how um, low tone can affect, um, you know, babies. So let's talk about sitting. So um, normally the evidence from the, the slide before showed that 50% of babies were floppy. So this low tone could be seen if the hips are widely abducted. So that means their hips are kind of falling apart. and um, can, but the problem with it falling apart is that it could lead to tightness in the outside of your hips. So if, if we just um, do a little test and we put our legs together and kind of, even if you're not squeezing your thighs, it kind of activates your inner thighs, uh, which in turn will activate your trunk and your extensors. So this little boy here in this video, you can, you can see that his, his trunk was a little bit more um, his feet were out to the side and his trunk was a little bit more forward. Um, this intervention that he did right here is a great way to kind of um, strengthen that. And he has a base of support now with the hip helpers, that, those little blue shorts he's wearing as a hip helper. Um, they basically are like bike shorts that you cut and you just kind of sewed the crotch together so you can't move your legs out that far, but it's a stretchy material that um, they still have enough freedom of movement. Um, he's also sitting on a unstable surface like a rocker board, so that's really helping engage the glute muscles. The glute muscles seem to be a little bit weak, and when you squeeze your butt, it kind of straightens your lower back up. Um, so that's a way that you can check. This little image on the left of the girl, uh, it looks like a parent holding their knees together. That's a way that you could check for um, hip tightness. If you can try to put their knees, if it's hard for them to sit like that, if you push their knees together, they might try to cheat and bend their trunk forward. But if you notice that, they might might be indications early on that there's some height, tightness and weakness in the hips. Um, so now uh, I'm just going to go to creeping and crawling. Um, hypermobile infants, and a lot of the videos that I've gotten here seem like kids that had a little bit more low tone um, because their hips are very wide apart. Um, again, it, because they get very wide, that there's a lot of tightness in the outside of the hip, so it makes it difficult for the thighs to come together um, to get into quadruped position for crawling. Um, so there are a bunch of kids that that kind of skip that stage or because they're tight. But if this is something you notice and if your child is at the crawling um, stage, the hip helpers or something to keep their hips under them would help them to get into a hands and knees position. Um, we'll play some of these videos. It's also maybe noted this early on that um, some of the kids have more of a one side that's stronger um, it, there's no research, unfortunately, about the stages of sitting and creeping. Um, there's only research on the ambulation, so uh, just looking back on the videos compared to some of the kids that we see now, we think there may have been a one-sided weakness, but, um, you know, no one ever thought it or heard it or said it. So if you do have a child that's crawling and you do notice they're propelling more with one than the other, then it's something to just keep in mind. I don't think it always works its way out. I think sometimes they need help to get it, to get it. Sometimes it does, and sometimes these kids go naturally into walking, but sometimes they kind of need a boost. So there's a question between like what's better, function or alignment. Um, some, I, I think in, 
you know, in this case, yes, of course, it's great that they're crawling. It's um, wonderful. But if you could try to combat both at the same time and get good alignment with the crawling, I would try to do both. Um, here is. Oops. So here is um, a little guy that we've seen. So he is crawling there, but I don't know if you saw that. Let's see if we can backwards it one time. He does have still a wide base of support. It's good that he's doing it reciprocally and he is able to prop up on his arms, which is a little bit harder for some of the kids to actually get into full arm extension with the reciprocal kneeling. So this is still a good progression. Um, but you could still notice, like the reason I'm even bringing this up is that there is an 88% of kids that have a wide base of support. So maybe there is some correlation between the sitting, the wide base sitting, and the wide base crawling and creeping that if we can kind of combat when they're younger, maybe it'll help with the walking later because they're building up the right muscles. Also with crawling and quadruped, if they don't get the weight bearing, I know a lot of kids um, skip crawling but I really recommend it, especially for kids that have Angelman syndrome, because there seems to be a lot of issues around the hips and the wide base, which can lead to um, you know, complications when they get older. So the more weight bearing they do under their hips and knees, um, it's actually great because they're building, they're solidifying the hip joint and the muscles around the joint. And if there is any tone issues when you get the muscles strong around the joint, then you know it helps to kind of hold that joint there when they do move into walking. So let me just go through the this research article showed um, the big study a study of the gait pattern in kids with Angelman. So it seems to be uh, the step length is how far one foot steps in front of the other, and that seems to be like a two to four year delay. It's probably because some of the kids walk later. So if they start walking at four, maybe that's why it takes four years kind of to catch up because typically it's gonna take 11 months to narrow the base of support, another 11 months to get reciprocal arm swing anyway. Um, so if you, it's probably common to see their gait like a six to nine year old around a typical four to five year old. Um, the thing that I do think that was, again, a little concerning was the base of support, the stride width. So um, they're basically stepping wide um, when they take, it's almost like a waddly step. Um, and the step was three times as wide um, in a six to nine year old compared to the typical four to five year old. So that's something why, um, a reason again why I'm reiterating to narrow the base of support as early as possible. Um, the cadence and the speed, so it says that the cadence is slightly slower. So the reason that um, the cadence is slower at six to nine versus a typical four to five year old is because they kind, it's kind of like an eight taxic gait. An eight taxic gait kind of means like they're stepping and there's pauses in between. Um, so they walk, walk, pause, step, pause. Um, so that's, it's not only smaller steps, smaller base of support, wider base of support, waddling, but then also the pauses in between. Did it change? Okay, so um, th here is um, these, and all these videos, this is um, Quincy using a typical pre-gate walk for a new walker. They're all good, but there are some slightly increased base of support, slightly increased ataxic gait, and she has a shorter um, stride length. Um, so I'm gonna just show you some videos of that. So this is her walking with shoes on and a stable surface. So you could see her taking the pauses in between. Um, let's see if I play that again. She has a high guard. It's all typical of new walking anyway, but the right foot does go out a little bit more than the left foot. Now with, uh, this is barefoot on a hard surface. And I really think it's good to try, again, generalize the walking by doing it on various surfaces. So again, a wide base of support, hands up, the mouthing, which she could, again, be doing to try to stabilize, and towing out, externally rotated. Just Oops. Sorry, I can't find the, the mouse. 
Okay, this is her walking on a soft surface. So even though she's, and this is bare feet, so this is probably the hardest it can get for her because now she has no shoes on and it's not a, um, it's not a, a hard surface anymore, but still it does make her slow down. Oops, sorry. Um, okay, so it does, it does kind of make her stop and slow down and stabilize herself before she gets to the next step. So she kind of has to put more weight into one foot before she steps through with another foot. So it's kind of good to um, try different surfaces when you start, start walking because it'll engage those stabilizers that they need. And it's kind of forcing her to use the stabilizers for a more controlled walk. Okay, so here is another study. Um, so it's, it looks like a higher percentage of kids that um, had a non-deletion, 79% of them were ambulatory and reached it around three and a half. Um, kids with a deletion, they only reported that, well, 40%, so about half were walking, and if those half were walking, they usually reached it by four years old. Um, it doesn't mean that more kids didn't walk or reach it later, it just didn't give me that number. Um, but usually when they start walking, they don't stop walking, um, but some of them, very rarely, they do lose that ability, and we could talk about that later. It could be from various reasons, like a growth spurt or um, illness or something. They might have minor regression, um, but they, could, oh, they have good muscle memory, so they can get it back. But what I did think uh, was interesting is that 25, about a quarter of each deletion and non-deletion, they all used a crouch gait. So that's something just to keep in mind now when, uh, if your kids are young or if they are not young and have developed it, um, you know, to prevent a crouch gait, some things that we could look for too. So let's just talk about what is a crouched gait. So a crouched gait is basically walking with your hips and knees in flexion and with your feet towing out. And again, it's important to address because it's observed in a quarter of the kids that have Angelman's. It's mostly seen around 13 years, but um, it it's, has a standard deviation of four, which means it could happen four years after that, four years before that, but average is 13 years. And they don't think it's any association with genotype, with uh, epilepsy, weight, height. There's nothing related to that. So the only thing I could think of is that, you know, there may have been some indications when they're younger that those muscles were weaker, um, which is okay. But now if you're aware of it, try to strengthen those muscles now. And if he's, they have already gotten to this point, then let's address those muscles that are weak and see what we can do. If there's no structural changes, if their hips, if they don't have a scoliosis, a fixed scoliosis, if there's no um, subluxation or dislocation in the hips, there's no reason that it can't be improved by muscle strengthening. So I would always try that first before opting to surgeries. So let's again talk about this crouch gait. So the, the image on the top, uh, top right, the normal gait pattern, if you just look at the right foot, I don't have a pointer, but the right foot is the one that's staying on the ground the whole time while the left foot goes through. So the top picture shows the right knee flexing and then actually gets into full extension when the front foot gets to the heel strike. Now in the crouched gait, if you look at the right foot, the right foot is pretty much staying bent and flexed the entire time. It's actually not getting extension and therefore you're not getting a heel strike on the other foot. Um, because stance time is more than 50% of your gait cycle, like when you stand on one leg through that gait cycle, it's important to look out for the way that they're stepping. Um, this is just another study that showed um, the black line is basically high, uh, where the kids with the crouched gait were versus the, there's a light gray line there where it should be. So the angle of the stance of knee flexion and hip flexion and internal rotation and anterior pelvic tilt is something I didn't talk about, but an anterior pelvic tilt is, is basically when you're crouched, I'll just show you real quick, but when your hips and knees are bent, it, it almost means like you have to stick out your stomach and your pelvis does tip a little bit forward because you have so much weight loaded over your knees. 
Um, so that's where the anterior pelvic tilt may come in. It might, and that's also an indication of your core ends up getting weak because you're not pulling your core muscles to get back, and maybe that's limited because you're so tight in your hip flexors now that you can't pull your core back. Um, so that's something to keep aware of. Now, I just wanted to touch on this. I know I talked a lot about the crouch gait and the flat foot and all that, but there's some articles that show a connection with Angelman syndrome and idiopathic toe walking. Um, it just, idiopathic just means for no rhyme and reason, like it's just random. There's no, nothing that's necessarily causing it, but this article does believe that there is a big sensory integration com component that may be causing it. And we don't, we don't exactly know why. Like, is it because they're seeking the sensory input? Are they trying to stabilize somewhere? Like, are they stabilizing on their toe and forefoot because they're not getting full ankle range of motion? Um, but basically, in this study of all the kids that had some kind of developmental delay, and that's including everything on that list, um, there was every one of those kids had some kind of sensory integration. So developmental delay, how does that connect? So maybe because they're not getting that input through their feet since they're young, maybe because it takes them longer to walk, they're craving it and they're craving it in other ways. Looking back on the videos of the crawling, if they're never crawling on their hands and knees or pushing off on their toes, they may not be getting that input, that, that solid weight bearing through their joints that they're craving, um, which means they it could be why they could be going back to toe walking. So how do we bridge the gap and how do we intervene? I thought this is a cute picture. <laughs> um, so don't worry because I hope I'm not scaring anybody, but uh, um, for every issue there's a solution. And my intention is not to scare anybody also, it's just to bring awareness because if you are aware of the things to look for, it's easier to combat them and you have a better intuition than any doctor I believe would. So um, here's all the things we talked about, um, the excessive hip flexion, knee flexion, wide base, externally rotated hips, shortened stride length, shortened stance time, hand, hands in high guard, and the decreased joint input. So here's what we're gonna do. So this is a question I always pose, do we teach the run before the walk? Um, this is a theory that we personally follow in our clinic that if you can teach a kid something beyond what they're ready for, it's getting them prepared in advance without using any compensation. So if a kid is not running yet, they may not even like have built a compensation or um, you know muscles to stabilize. So you're kind of teaching them the right way. And the idea is that with neuroplasticity, it trickles down into some of the things of walking. Um, so let me show, I don't know if where my pointer is, sorry. So this little boy is not standing independently yet. Um, he's, this is a technique called Square Vest Medic Exercises where he's, he does have Angelman's too. All the kids in this video have Angelman's syndrome. And um, by holding him at his lowest joint, it's forcing him to engage his trunk, hip, and knee. So it's almost provoking an automatic response that if he could do it in the air, then he could more likely do it on a stable surface. So here is him trying it in another way on a wood board. Yeah, it looks, it looks crazy, but it really does help. You see his hands are already coming down, or one hand is coming down out of the high guard. It's almost like, all right, I got this. Yep, he wasn't leaning on him. And here is, whoops. No, no. Okay, this little boy is basically, I mean, because of the visual issues too, by walking over something with holes in it, it's, it's very challenging, he's not, he just started walking, but doing walking and doing something more challenging is almost helping integrate all those uh, reflexes in. Um, here's some ideas to increase stance time and improve um, the balance and ataxia. So this is, uh, these are basically boxes on wood planks, like you could just, uh, if you don't have a rocker board, there's ways to make rocker boards and you just make a skinny plank and put a box on top of it. And again, it's forcing her to 
use the right muscles and engage that core because they don't want to fall at the end of the day. It's almost like flight or fight response. If there's a way to catch their balance, then they, they most likely do. Um, so by stepping over things, it's increasing the stance time of one leg. Um, the, with Quincy, we use a lot of visual cues because she doesn't look where she's walking all the time. So it's making her aware that there's a surface there to step over. And she really does hold the weight well on one to lift the other. So that's helping with the stance time. Um, and kicking. Kicking is a great way to increase um, stance time on one leg. So Chloe here has to put all the weight on her left foot in order to kick with the right. Right now she does have weights at her ankles, these pulleys, and um, some grounding, so it's making it harder for her. But it's letting her learn the skill. Whoops. So activating the core and decreasing the high guard. The, the high guard will come down when the core is also activated. So, I mean, regular sit-ups, decline sit-ups. This is Naveen. He's using his arms too much to push through, and that's why we put an unstable surface under his arms. Um, but he did great there. This is um, Quincy holding a ball. So weighted stuff and bringing your hands together help to decrease that high guard and also activate your core. So if you could see her walking, she doesn't really have that uh, lumbar lordosis where she's sticking her belly out. Her belly is tucked in and then again, that makes the gait look better. And here's Naveen again, he's, he's base, oh. He's standing on two skinny planks. Again, it's forcing the base of support to come a little more narrow under him, and he's keeping his balance. We're joking that he's about to do a squat, and he's trying, so it's cute. Um, here are some ideas to improve hip extension. Um, so backwards walking, if you, if you don't have a treadmill, or if you do have a treadmill, you don't necessarily need bungees to hook them up. If, if you make like a PVC pipe that can come in front of them and a, like a little stand on the side, some people have done that where they can hold the PVC pipe and still go backwards on a treadmill. Um, or if you wanted to hold them up, the, the motion of the backwards walking is really good for the hip extension. These are all great ways to prevent a crouched gait and also to activate the muscles that aren't commonly seen um, active squats are another one. Oh, that's not squats. Okay, this is tall kneel walking. So tall kneeling is a kind of a hard thing to do because you have to kind of squeeze your butt. Um, for the people that go to church, a lot of people, a lot of times, uh, when somebody's kneeling on the pew after two seconds, their butt comes down, and that's kind of a good example of it's very hard to squeeze your butts to to hold it up just for that short period of time. So by strengthening that, that'll the glutes will make the posture, the back, everything better. So tall kneeling, tall kneel walking, adding weights, um, anything like that would really help to build up that. This is squats. Any type of squats would be good. Right now, Mason has a really good basis support here while he's doing squats. Um, if they're very wide, you could put a TheraBand around their knees. Um, even doing it at the wall is a great idea. Every time he pushes back up, he's using his hip extension so, and knee extension. So this is, um, squats are great to do. Um, sit to stand from low surfaces. That really has to force your um, weight forward. And let's try that one again. If you have your feet on an unstable surface also, it really um, makes you, it, it kind of forces you to be extended. If, you, if your feet are on an unstable surface and you um, don't straighten up, you're going to fall on your face. So it kind of is forcing them to stand up. So sit to stand from low surfaces and try with something unstable under their butt, like a disc under their butt or something under their feet. Okay, rotated hips. So I'm, I'm going to just show this example of um, 
Naveen. He's trying to do a hip extension. There's a big correlation between the rotation and the hip extension. So they kind of work hand in hand because the glutes are also part of your rotator muscles. So he hears him, his, his foot is really in a bad, it's not in a great position. He's doing a wide, uh, it's kind of like a wide leg kick down. So it's good just to observe that and know that, um, you know, that may be the typical compensation he's trying to use to get his hip out. He's trying to make his hip more wide. Um, so then we notice it and we try to connect it, so uh, correct it, I mean. So now he's doing hip extensions against weights and his foot is in a much better alignment. Um, I mean, we have pulleys, but this is something you guys could do. It doesn't have to be with pulleys. If you have your child laying down flat and put a wrap weight around their ankle, um, and just do up and downs, like kicking down like a bowling pin or a bolster or a ball, um, it will work the same way. Sorry, I don't know what's happening. Here's another example of the sit to stand. The sit to stand is great for rotation because it's very hard to stand up from something with your knees knocking. So the knees kind of are forced to come out when you do a low surface sit to stand. And then, I don't know what's happening to the videos, guys, I'm sorry. Um, this is basically like a, um, it's basically a, what's it called, an ace wrap, a Fabrifoam wrap. So um, if a child is having too much um, rotation out, um, it's more efficient to walk with, it's not really that efficient to walk with your foot turned out. If your foot is so turned out, it means you're not using your hip and um, knee flexors. Once your foot is turned in more, you're stepping through with your hip and knee. Um, so by using like an ace wrap or, or something to wrap the foot into more neutral, it's a very subtle thing, but it helps to just give them that little bit of, um, you know, corrected rotation. And um, that's a simple idea that you guys can do as well. Okay, and to improve hip and knee flexion and extension. Let's see which one plays first. Okay, so this is sitting on a scooter board. This is also a great activity to do. This scooter board was too low for Naveen without the box, so we put the box in front of it. And um, you could do this with two feet, but a lot of times they are overpowering with one foot over the other. So if you notice that one foot is not getting a heel strike or pulling, this is a great way to strengthen your hamstrings. Um, so that's an idea. Swinging is a great thing to try to do too. It's fun for the kids, but you're working on your knee flexion and extension here as well. Um, she also has weights on her ankles, so she's strengthening. It's In the beginning, they may not understand, but if you do it with them and um, swing, it's another way um, to get that hip and knee flexion. And riding a bike. So I'll, um, some of the videos that people sent, um, it looked like they had a very wide base of support even on the bicycling. So if you do notice that, now that you're aware of it, just use a band or something. It doesn't have to be so tight that the knees end up coming in together, but just something subtle to keep them in a better alignment because they will, she, she's going real fast now because it's more efficient to bike when your knees are over your feet. It's very hard if you guys bike to know that, you know, to push with your knees way out. So biking is a great exercise, but uh, in this case, I, you know, I would pick the alignment um, with the function. Um, here's some ways to narrow the base of support. Um, so basically we want to decrease the pathway. So here's a narrow pathway. So she has no choice but to keep her legs a little closer because there's no other way to get through. So just make little mazes or small spaces that will help your child decrease your base. Here's another way, sit to stand and a, a narrow base of support. This is Quincy walking with the full there suit on. So the, and with, with some, these are basically like straps, like the rotation strap I saw, but a, a, a way more complex version because it can mimic each muscle group. Um, so this is, if you see the back of her feet, there's one foot almost connected to the opposite hip. So that's kind of bring the base closer. So if you don't, if you don't do intensive therapy or suit therapy, this and you do notice that there is, um, you know, a wide base, you could try to put a belt on them and and try to crisscross 
from their shoe to the opposite side of the hip so it kind of brings their feet in and it's elastic so they still have space to move forward. And this is in the beginning uh, when she was, it's kind of the theory of teaching the child to um, run before you walk. So this is hard for her. And we have a little bit of loose support on her, so she, but, but she ends up getting it. She ends up feeling it. In the beginning, she doesn't know where her foot should go and then she figures it out, so. Uh, where's my other video? Oh, I have a video here and it's not coming up. But it's basically a kid use, it was Quincy and she was wearing flippers. So flippers are a great um, way to increase the stride length. So it kind of forces you to, to lift up your feet. If you don't lift up your feet, you're gonna trip over the top of the flippers. Um, you know, it's just the ones you just buy like in the summertime for the kids to play with, so that's fine. Um, sometimes wearing big shoes, as long as a f the like long shoes, that kind of gives the same idea. Um, pushing something, this video is not working either, but pushing something that is fast will kind of force the increased stride length too. This is a barrel on a scooter board and it's moving fast, so Mason has to keep up with it and move his feet fast to keep up with that. Oh, maybe there it is. Here's another idea of putting um, uh, spaces between boxes so they have to take a bigger stride length because they can't get over to the next one unless they reach with a big stride length. Um, and then also incorporating sensory integration. Oh good, I'm glad the videos show, but these are just those tiles that you buy from the dollar store and we just put stuff on top of them, different surfaces like rugs, squeegees, whatever. Um, it really helps to get the input on your feet. Um, and when Quincy was walking on her toes intermittently here and there, that was a great thing to help bring her back down. Um, so that's a simple thing to do at home. A vibration board, I don't know if anyone um, has one, but th that's also a great idea. A vibration really calms your muscles down and kids with low tone, it kind of builds up the right muscles. Um, so it really has a lot of benefits. If your child though does have seizures, just make sure that it's not vibration that, are, that triggers it. For most of the kids, it's not that we have seen that have Angelman, so they all kind of benefit from using the vibration board. But if you do notice that uh, it could be a trigger, um, just to keep that in mind. Um, sand and water is a great way because sand kind of forces uh, an increased uh, stride length. It's weighted, the feeling on your feet. Um, she ends up doing like a little run there. And her hands are in high guard because it is unstable and it's uneven. Um, but the sand and water is a great um, tool for her or for kids in general to try to incorporate. If you don't live by a beach, just filling up those, um, uh, what's it called, the bins that you put under your bed, those are great ones because they're kind of big enough that you could do it in your home. A little messy, but still nice. So many possibilities. So basically you prioritize what's first for you. Is it function or is it alignment? Um, try to start early. Any videos coming up? I have videos here, but they're not coming up. Um, just keep in mind that they might have regressions when they have illnesses, when they have growth spurts. What happens sometimes with the growth spurt is that the bones grow so much faster than the muscles can adapt to, and now they're using the muscles in a new range, which was kind of hard for them to use in the first place. So if they look like they're regressing, it might be a week or two, which is fine, then they'll be like, okay, adjust to the new muscle length. But if you notice that it's prolonged time where they're not coming out of it, try to do something that they even did in the younger years to get past that point, because it's just like when a baby has a torticollis, this is, um, you know, sometimes their head is kinked to one, to one side and, and then it comes out of it and then when they start sitting you'll notice it comes back because they almost use that familiar pattern to stabilize because they don't know how to move and then when they're uh, crawling, uh, same thing. Sorry, I don't know, that's my kiddos. Uh, I don't know what happened to the video, but um, same thing. When they're crawling, the torticollis might come back and then it comes out. So this is the same thing with kids with Angelman's. You might see the wide base of support coming back, the ataxagate. They might want to crawl again or hold your hand. 
Um, so as long as it's a short-term bout, it's okay. It's going to normally happen. It's just that if you notice that it's happening prolonged, then we have to go back to some of those basics. So some of those hip extensions, some of those knee flexion extension. It's not just about stretching. It has to be strengthening because there is a lot of hypermobileness in the joints and the, the, the stronger the muscles get around the joints, the less they're going to have complications later on. And you know, the, because we are, um, you know, fortunate enough to learn a lot of new things now, it's, it's good to see. But with the Angelman's research, there isn't a lot of research on um, the babies at the early stage. If there's some issues with the reflexes and the sitting and crawling, it just happens to be that, you know, thank God for all your videos, that we're able to see some, some same issues in crawling and sitting that they're having in walking. So it's kind of, hopefully there will be some more research done to it. But I hope this helps a little bit. Thanks.